la riqueza de los alimentos. Solo por Wobby. When you sit down bleary-eyed with a box of cereal, you may think that you're just grabbing a quick, nutritious breakfast. But you're also contributing to the biggest success story of the modern food industry. Inside the cereal box is one of the most sophisticated confections of invention, processing and advertising that modern business has ever seen. Until the breakfast cereals arrived, there was no such thing as convenience foods. They've transformed what we eat and the way we live. Breakfast cereals have contributed to changing the entire pattern of the meal structure in Britain. And if you understand breakfast cereals, you'll understand the modern food business. Breakfast cereals in many ways are the archetypal processed food, product of modern capitalist food economics. They're great! With exclusive access to the world's largest food companies, this series tells the inside story of how big business feeds us. Over the last 50, 60 years, there's been a radical change from a time of uh, very little availability to a time of plenty. Ah! Told through three products that business has transformed from novelty into necessity. Cereals, bottled water, and yogurt. This is the story of how giant food companies transform cheap commodities into hugely profitable brands. It's just like a blank canvas for an artist to create products using very cheap materials to create enormously lucrative products. And how they persuade us to fork out billions by selling us dreams. Advertising is one of the foundations of the modern food industry, there's no question about it. It's also the story of an industry that exploits our health fears and courts controversy. It's a trick that has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. Say it's going to prevent cancer. You can take that ingredient that costs a few cents and then sell it for multiples. This is the story of the foods that make billions. July 2010 and behind the imposing walls of Kellogg's Manchester HQ. Morning, everyone. Do you want to move a little bit closer, please? Some of the finest minds in the cereal world have gathered to hear about the future shape of breakfast. Yeah, if you squeeze up a little bit more and then we'll make a start. Careers, reputations, and the future of Coco the monkey himself hang in the balance. We've got the biggest ever launch program for a Coco Pop cereal. In six weeks, Kellogg's is launching Chock and Roll, its new wheel-shaped cereal. The prize? A slice of the money-spinning UK children's breakfast market, worth over half a billion pounds annually. This new formula for Chock and Roll, we've been working on this for two years. Sometimes you don't get it right the first time, and you learn from your mistake and you come back and try again. It's taken a lot of legwork to get this far. We tested a whole range of different shapes. We tasted links and chains and squares and triangles. Um, you name it, we tested it. And what we actually found was that this wheel really, really captured kids' imaginations. We're going to be advertising to mum, both in TV and in press. Um, and we're going to be spending roughly three million pounds to do this. And that's a lot of money. What we're working towards is the 16th of August. This is a critical date for Kellogg's and Chock and Roll. And what we need to ensure is that we've got it in full distribution to maximize the TV that goes live that week. The supermarkets are primed and ready. Nothing has been left to chance. Oh, I'm sorry, darling. Even the exact shelf space has been reserved. It's going to be next to Coco Pops Original. Lovely. On the middle shelf, on a minimum of two facings. So it gives us maximum opportunity to get in front of Mum. It is one of 
100 new cereals that will be launched this year. Mummy, mummy! Is that what you want? Yeah. Space is always at a premium and the people have to justify new lines, so it's always a constant battle to get that little bit of room. They're doing you a favour, they're giving you space and you've got to promote hard and advertise and get people in there to pick the stuff off the shelves. But if brands don't deliver at the checkout, then the end is swift and brutal. Once you get on the shelf, if the product doesn't sell, well, it's going to come off the shelf. You see more new products launched in the UK than any other market in the world, and a higher proportion of them fail. So it's a high-stakes game. Seven hundred products compete for our attention in a saturated sector. But what all cereals have in common is that they started as grain, a cheap and characterless commodity. The grain is processed before advertising loads it with meaning. The result is sold for a big profit. Understand this process and you understand the modern food business. From the industry point of view, cereals are just wonderful because what they are is really, at heart, carbohydrates, pretty cheap to buy. It's just like a, a, a blank canvas for an artist to create products using very cheap materials to create enormously lucrative products. 94% of us have a box of cereal in our kitchen cupboards. But a century ago, nobody did. How did this emblematic industry colonize our kitchen cupboards so comprehensively? The answers lie in a sleepy American town, surrounded by a surplus of corn. The extraordinary thing about breakfast cereal is how you can locate it to this one place, Battle Creek, Michigan. Battle Creek actually changed the eating habits of the world. It really goes back to these two extraordinary brothers, W.K. Kellogg and his older brother, John Harvey Kellogg. J.H. Kellogg was a teetotal, vegetarian, Seventh-day Adventist. John Harvey Kellogg was the doctor who had set up this sanatorium, which was doing all sorts of weird quack cures involving hydropathy and water and enemas, and he was obsessed with constipation and masturbation and vegetarian diets. When not engaged in giving his patients pint after pint of yogurt and water enemas, he fed them on tasteless cooked flakes, the precursors of today's cereals. And then you have his younger brother, eight years younger, W.K. Kellogg, who had initially gone into the family business trying to sell brooms, and he was the entrepreneur. William Keith Kellogg's masterstroke was to add sugar to his brother's plain flakes to make them taste better and easier to sell. W.K. could see a profit if they could start selling this cornflake they invented. John Harvey called him in and said, I understand you want to put sugar on one of our cereals. And W.K. said, yes, I do. And John Harvey said, I will not allow it. And the two brothers split then. And in 1906, W.K. Kellogg started the Toasted Corn Flake Company. Right from the beginning with breakfast cereal, because of the relationship between these two brothers, there was a double thing going on, an obsession with health from John Harvey and a great desire to make money from WK. And what resulted was Kellogg's cornflakes, which sort of eventually became one of the most successful foods in the world. Some say the decision to add sugar to grain was cereal's moment of original sin. It led to unimaginable profits but also triggered a debate about food additives that still rages today. Back in Battle Creek, imitators saw there was big money to be made from cornflakes. It was like a gold rush. At that time, you could buy a bushel of grain for 75 cents and make $12 worth of cereal from it. I think in the year 1911, there was something like 108 different brands of cornflakes all being produced in this one tiny corner of America. What set Kellogg's apart was WK's visionary commitment to advertising. He 
gambled a third of his startup capital on one advertisement in a ladies' home journal, one of the most widely read magazines of his day. This single act helped usher in the modern world of advertising that we all now inhabit. W.K. Kellogg advertising was unbelievable. He put an ad. He asked the women of America, stop buying cornflakes because we can't keep up with the supply. But down at the bottom was a coupon where you could get a supply of corn. Well, reverse psychology, women went out and bought it. From the very early days, the brands were built through, through advertising, building relationships with consumers, dramatizing the individual benefits of the individual brands. So absolutely critical to their success. His punt paid off. Cornflakes were an instant hit. Sales leapt from 33 cases a day to nearly 3,000. Over the next decades, the firm advertised heavily in print and radio, building Kellogg's Cornflakes into a national brand. But the advent of television and the opportunities it presented supercharged its transformation into one of the first truly global food brands. Selling food would never be the same again. Television killed radio just like that. Television became where people spent more of their leisure time than anywhere else. I mean, it was an irresistible force for any advertiser. Better advertising is what the Leo Burnett Company is all about. The man who taught Kellogg's and the rest of the food industry how to harness the power of this new medium was legendary ad man Leo Burnett. He was obviously really impressed with its power and with its uh, ability to translate products directly to consumers. But if it hadn't been for a chance encounter on a train, an historic partnership would never have been formed. It would alter food advertising history. In 1949, Leo Burnett, who lived in Ann Arbor, Michigan, was traveling to Chicago, as was Mr. Kellogg, on a train, and they met. And they talked, and Leo never stopped selling advertising. It was then that uh, Mr. Kellogg gave Mr. Burnett the brief, and the first brief was, was really around cornflakes. The advertising that they produced, in many ways, we'd look at it now and we'd find it quite quaint. But at the time, it was, was highly revolutionary, and what they did was they created characters. I think Leo Burnett, the agency, had a talent for creating characters and sticking with them and exploiting them. Yes, sir, Tony the Tiger from Kellogg's. I wouldn't miss my... And that Tony the Tiger represented a way of thinking that we were good at, we were real good at. Imagery, yeah. Here's the secret formula for the secret toasted in frosting. If anybody tries He took to a threatening to beast and made him friendly. <laughs> he moved him being a threat to a friend. You can't imagine him going great and it biting you. <laughs> They're great! Tony the Tiger was created back in the 50s and Coco the Monkey back in the 60s. But they're indelibly linked to the food. And consumers still love the food. And they love the characters that come on their cereal box with their food. And moms and dads have grown up with the characters. Um, and they pass that love along to their kids. So it's kind of a, uh, it's a virtuous circle. <laughs>